My guest this week is the Pulitzer Prize winning American photographer, Lindsay Adario. Ukraine, Afghanistan, South Sudan, to name but a few, she has been there with her camera at the majority of the conflicts in the 21st century. I want to hear about the stories behind those images and what it's like living, working, existing on the front lines of these wars. Lindsay, thank you so much for joining me and joining all of our viewers. I know it's rare for you to be sitting in a seat safely away from what you're <laughs> covering normally with your camera. You've come to the world's attention many times with your work over the years, but very recently at the beginning of this year, in fact, just a, a few weeks after the war started in Ukraine, you did come to the attention of many people because you took a photo of a Ukrainian family of four trying to cross a bridge who had been killed. And that photo ended up on the front pages of the New York Times. Can you tell me a bit about how you came to that scene? So I went and I went directly to the East and was covering the East uh, for about 10 days before the war started. When the war began, I went to Kiev and immediately was covering sort of daily missile strikes and the destruction and, and those who had been killed and injured. And so, one day I was watching images come out um, from the wires and others who went to the Irpin Bridge. And there were, you know, hundreds of civilians crossing, the elderly women, children, crossing out of Irpin and all of those suburbs. And so um, we made our way toward the bridge through side roads. And, um, and as we approached, uh, there were injured, the territorial defense soldiers were taking injured over to sort of a brick wall off to the side. So we ran across the street and almost as soon as we got behind that wall, a round came in. So it was either a mortar round or a tank shell, we're not sure. It came in and hit sort of off to the distance. And then the Ukrainian military fired back. And so my security advisor said, would you like to go? And I said, no, because everyone knows this is a civilian evacuation route. And they're not, those rounds are probably going toward a Ukrainian base that's off in the distance. But how wrong I was. Uh, the next round came in closer. And so we dove for cover. And as soon as we popped back up, the next round came in right next to us, essentially. And it was sort of equidistant between us and a mother and her two children and a church volunteer that was helping usher them to safety. Um, it was very chaotic. Um, and the, obviously, we were all sort of in shock because the round had landed very close to us. Everything was very dusty. Um, and our security advisor immediately went to the aid of, of um, the injured yeah. and to a soldier who was nearby. And by the time he called us over, um, you know, the protocol is we wait to be told, you know, it's clear you can come. And so by the time he called us over, uh, I ran across the street not knowing what to expect. Obviously, I knew there was someone injured, but I anticipated it being a soldier. Mm -hmm. And um, although there were civilians crossing steadily and even during the strike, I mean, because no, nothing was shielded. So people had to continue to move. And so when I got there, I came upon uh, these four lifeless bodies. Um, of course, I didn't know if they were dead or alive at that point. Um, I noticed sort of the tiny little moon boots of a child. And as a mother, that was sort of a, a sort of incredibly jarring and devastating moment. Um, and I was trying to survey, but I was also kind of in shock. And I one side of my brain was sort of saying, you have to start photographing um, and you have to take these pictures because I knew that I had just witnessed, a, you know, something that was an intentional targeting of civilians. And so I took a few photographs, but rounds were still coming in. So we were, our security advisor, Steve, was saying, you know, hurry up, work very quickly, and we have to leave. And so I kind of moved around the scene and taking a few photographs, thinking in my head also, I, I have to be respectful. And, you know, perhaps I shouldn't show the faces. So I was trying to take pictures that... Uh, showed the faces and that didn't show the faces so that we had some options. Well, the image you, you, I'm talking about, or certainly the, the version I've seen, 
you, you don't necessarily look at the faces, actually, the way, now you've said that, the way that you look at the image. You can. I, it you is, can see them. But you can see them. But it's more you look at the scene exactly. of a family. Exactly. And so I've been doing this for, I've been covering war for over 20 years. And I know that there are so many images I've taken that have never been published because they're, they're graphic. And so I was thinking of that as I was shooting as horrible as that sounds, because obviously I've just witnessed the most devastating scene, but I'm also a photojournalist and that's my job. And so I was I was trying different angles. And frankly, I I didn't think the picture could ever be published because it was civilians. Do you, do you, know, do you know the impact of that photo? Yeah, I mean, it's been used uh, by the by, uh, I think, the United States ambassador to the United Nations um, to talk about the intentional targeting of civilians. Um, it's been used repeatedly as proof that civilians were targeted because I was there. I witnessed the run up and I and I know that whoever was firing those rounds was bracketing onto that position. You mentioned being a mother. Has that changed the job for you? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely changed the job in the sense that I'm more cautious now um, than I was before I had children. Um, I think to a sort of normal person who doesn't do this for a living, they probably can't see that. But for me making decisions on a minute to minute basis in a war zone, I know I'm being more cautious. I know I'm not going sort of all the way to the front um, or as far forward as some of my colleagues might be going. You also are now seeing, perhaps when you see an image, when you create an image, when you see the reality of a child who who is dead in front of you, would have always affected you, I imagine. Always. Has it changed though? Yes, it has changed. I think, um, you know, I photographed, um, I have photographed children dying um, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Somalia during the Horn of Africa drought in 2011. And it was always devastating. But I think now as a mother, the first thing I do is sort of put myself in the shoes of that mother. And I know, you know, I live in constant fear that something will happen to my children. So you're trying to keep yourself safe, but you're also trying to document at the same time. Of course. And perhaps processing it in a slightly different way. I mean, I are you, would you say you have become desensitized though? And no. do you have to be in any way? No, not at all. I mean, I think, um, I think I have ways of dealing with my emotion in that moment. But, um, you know, part of that is just really focusing on the task at hand, which is making photographs um, and looking through the viewfinder. That definitely helps me focus on taking pictures. Um, but I'm not desensitized at all. I mean, I cry pretty much all the time when I'm photographing. Um, I get very, very emotional and that's okay. I mean, I, you know, I don't have an issue with that. I, I don't know what my colleagues think of me, but you know, I, I, I think it's normal. I mean, I'm a human being. And, and do you think, I mean, you talked about hanging back because of the risk as well, not necessarily going straight to the front. And yet when I asked you about that particular image, it sounded like it's very instinct instinctive when you know you're not where you need to be and you are heading towards danger. Correct. And that's obviously what I struggle with because if I'm close and something happens a little closer or a little further from me but closer to the front line, uh, I'll likely go. But I think my where I'm positioning myself is sort of a little removed back and then making judgment calls every day. Um, you know, if I hear that a school has been hit and 30 children have been killed, I will go. You know, if I hear that a building has been hit on the front line, but no civilians were killed, I'm likely not to go. So I'm weighing sort of what will I gain from risking my life? Although that building's been hit, but no civilians have been killed. I mean, this talks to the idea of not you per se, but a criticism of those in your field of being war junkies, trying mm. to find the very worst mm. to document mm. and being in places they don't need to be, mm. sometimes causing perhaps more risk. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you say to that? You know, for me, the highest toll of war is civilian casualties. Yes. So that's not being a war junkie, that is documenting reality. And the reality is, we are in a situation where one country has invaded another and every civilian who dies uh, is uh, is on account of that invasion. And so I think that um, if I'm in a position and civilians are being killed, 
I have to document that. That is a very important part um, of the job of someone who covers conflict. And, and presumably that for you in, in this work that you do, you don't obviously just cover war, you've covered humanitarian disasters, Correct. climate Correct. change, the, the effects on the planet on that. But it, when it is about civilians, it sounds like the justification you have to make to yourself, to your family and to those who could be critical is that you are providing evidence. Yeah, and that evidence has been used already by the United Nations. Have you taken pictures of, of people killing others, of the actual killers before? Yeah, uh, I mean, I've taken pictures of people who have been accused of kill killing others, but I have not been there sort of in the moment. I, I just wonder what that's like as well, you know, the, the seeing people do the very worst they can do to each other. I think people are very smart about journalists. You know, they obviously don't allow us access to things when they are killing civilians. You know, I think that there was a time in the Korngal Valley. Um, I was with uh, the American troops, the 173rd Airborne. I had spent two months living on the side of a mountain with the 173rd. Um, me and a colleague, Elizabeth Rubin, for the New York Times Magazine. And the point was to understand the nuances of war and why so many civilians were dying in Afghanistan. And in fact, um, Lieutenant Colonel Oslan, who was the commander of the Korngal Valley, was very smart because he had this philosophy of transparency, because he believed that journalists needed to understand sort of the nuances of war to understand why civilians were being killed. And so um, we were in Rock, uh, Operation Rock Avalanche, which was in the movie, the documentary Restrepo, that I don't know if you've seen it, but it's extraordinary. And um, so we were in that operation where we jumped out of helicopters in the middle of the night into the heart of Taliban territory, literally walked with everything we owned for six days. And eventually we were ambushed by the Taliban. And we were ambushed from three sides. And there was a huge gun battle. Three soldiers were shot. One was killed. And in the retaliation of the American troops, I was standing with some of the soldiers. Everyone was very shaken up, of course. and. One of the soldiers said, look, they're using Afghan women and children as human shields. And he literally had me look through the scope of his gun. And there were women and children on the roofs of the building where they were shooting from. And that is a case where it was incredible to witness. And I could only have witnessed that if I, because I had spent so much time with these troops and really was willing to risk my life and to be there in the middle of Operation Rock Avalanche. Um, a shot you took during that maneuver, um, we're going to take a look at that. Can you take me through it? There is an image, uh, the aftermath of that ambush, where it's a very dusty picture. It is a scout team carrying the body of Sergeant Rugel, um, and he's in a body bag, and it was after that. And the, the scout team, uh, Clenard, who is sort of leading the way, is crying, and they're walking through this very sort of desolate landscape. And I remember shooting that photograph and asking myself, what are we doing here? You know, what are we doing here years after 9-11 fighting in the middle of the mountains where there are no people, you know? And it just felt like such a waste that this young man had died for nothing. And in fact, a few years later, uh, the American troops pulled out entirely from that area. There's another image of yours I wanted to bring to mind and for us to have a look at and talk about an 18-year-old woman in labor stranded in 2009. Tell me about that and how that came about. So uh, in 2009, um, I won a MacArthur Fellowship. That is in America, it's called the Genius Grant. And it's essentially um, given to all different disciplines from a cellist to a scientist to a photographer, um, where I was paid a salary for five years with no strings attached to just focus on my work. And I I felt a lot of pressure to decide what to focus on with my work because it was the first time I could decide mm -hmm. not uh, be assigned a story. And so I started doing research and I decided to focus on maternal mortality and why uh, over 500,000 women a year were dying in childbirth at that point. Uh, this was 2009, as you said. And Afghanistan, where I had been working for a decade at that point, had one of the highest rates of maternal death in the world. Um, and that was because there was such a bad road network, people, women who 
were uh, pregnant or in labor, didn't have access necessarily to medical professionals or to clinics or hospitals that were staffed mm -hmm. with doctors. They just couldn't get where they needed to get They just couldn't to. get to where they needed to. They had to take a donkey for 12 hours and imagine being in labor, uh, you know, getting on the back of a donkey. And so I went uh, to very remote villages in Badakhshan province, which was one of these provinces with high numbers. And on the way back, uh, I was riding with Dr. Ziba, who was also helping me translate. And we noticed these two women on the side of a mountain. And there was not a man with them, which in Afghanistan is very rare. And we stopped the car and said, uh, what are you doing here? Do you need help? And it turned out the woman on the right, Nor Nisa, was in labor. And um, Nor Nisa's husband's first wife had died in childbirth. And he was so determined to not lose her that he managed to get a car in the village but when we met them, their car had broken down. So they were stranded on the side of the road. So I said, well, just get in my car. I'll take you to the hospital. We're going toward Faizabad, mm -hmm. which was the capital of the state. And uh, they said, no, uh, we need permission from the husband, so we'll wait. And so I turned to, Nor I turned to uh, Dr. Ziba and I said, okay, you have to find the husband. There's one road in the whole province. He's obviously on that yeah. road, you know. So she found him, of course, pretty quickly um, and brought him back. And the whole, car the whole family piled in my car and we took them to the hospital. And everyone asked me if she delivered safely and if I took photographs. And yes, she delivered safely. But no, I did not take photographs because I felt like I changed the course of that story with my presence mm. by taking them. So but you took a photo. I took about three frames. And that photograph is one of those frames. And that's when you had met and just seen her because it's so exactly. striking, the blue. Exactly. I met them. We asked uh, their story, and then we asked permission right before Ziba left to find the husband. Uh, we asked permission for me to take a few photographs. Do, do you think, on balance, being a woman has been a help to you in this a field? A huge help. Uh, being a woman rather than a hindrance. hindrance. Yes, everyone thinks it's a hindrance, but in fact, it's a huge help because people. Um, first of all, I have access to men and women, um, and particularly when I'm working in countries like Afghanistan and Somalia, where men and women are usually segregated by gender. Um, and people underestimate women, I find, and they still do. And so they sort of discount me and say, okay, sure, sure, go it's do nice it. nice to be underestimated. Yeah, I love it? being underestimated. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yes. It's one of those things. But I mean, I suppose on the, more, the other serious, much more serious side of it is that, again, when you're thinking and calculating risks, yeah. you know, rape as a weapon of war yeah. is a unique Huge. tool wielded against women. Yes. And for me, uh, when I was, I've been kidnapped twice. The first time was in Iraq, and that was only a day. And, and it turned out, compared to Libya, was quite sort of, it was manageable in the sense that we were uh, working outside of Fallujah. I was working with a colleague from the, from the New York Times. Uh, we had heard a helicopter of American troops went down. We went to find it. We got caught by insurgents who thought maybe we were with the American occupation we finally convinced them we were journalists. They held us until dusk and then eventually let us go. Obviously, it was terrifying. We had yeah. guns to our heads for about 11 hours. Uh, we didn't know if we would survive. Libya was uh, much more violent, much more dramatic. Uh, we were four journalists in one car. Originally, we had been two in each car, but one of the cars, uh, one of the driver's brothers had been shot at the front line. So he quit in the middle of the battle and we ended up in one car. Um, we had to decide how long to stay. Um, that is not an easy uh, discussion because with four journalists, everyone has a different perspective on how long to stay, what our needs are, how dangerous the situation is. By the time we decided to pull back east toward Benghazi, we ran into one of uh, Gaddafi's troops' che checkpoints. Um, it was incredibly hostile. The rebels we had been covering started opening fire on that checkpoint, so we were literally in a wall of bullets. Um, the men were pulled out of the car. Me as the only woman, I was sort of left sitting there because they didn't know what to do with me. Um, but the car was not armored, so I had to get out of the car mm. because I knew that I needed to get behind cover. Um, I crawled across the back seat, and when I jumped out, uh, one of Gaddafi's troops sort of came to me and was pulling at my cameras. Uh, instinctively, I was pulling back, even though there were bullets literally going, zoom, zoom, you know, next all 
around us. Um, we finally made it to cover behind the sort of uh, checkpoint building and we're all told to lie face down in the dirt. Uh, we each had a Kalashnikov put to our heads and we were about to be executed. Uh, we were begging for our lives. Um, the commander came over at that point and said, you can't execute them, they're American, which uh, this was all in Arabic and Anthony Shadi uh, later translated wow. for us. Um, you know, in retrospect, I have no idea why they spared us being American, because in the Middle East, yeah. a lot of people don't like our foreign policy. Um, and so we were tied up and blindfolded. Um, and essentially for the next three days, we were beaten up, tied up, blindfolded, threatened with execution. And for me, as the only woman, I was touched repeatedly. Um, I was not raped. But of course, in that time, being tied up and bl blindfolded, I thought of the many, many women I have interviewed over the years who have been raped. And so I sort of uh, ironically looked to them for strength because I thought, well, if they survived it and if it happens to me, I can survive it as well. Are, are you living just minute to minute? Minute to minute. Yeah, I mean, in a kidnapping, there is no sort of an hour down the line. It is literally... Uh, every second uh, is survival mode. It is, what can I do to get through this fear? What can I do to get through this pain? Um, do you, I mean, it, it sounds like the scene from a film, and yet it's your life. And I, I, yeah. I believe Jennifer Lawrence has been interested in your life, or there was, she was talk um, of a film. <laughs> she was. Uh, we spent about three years together uh, when Warner Brothers optioned the rights to my memoir. I wrote a memoir after that. Um, called It's What I Do, A Photographer's Life of Love and War. And um, that memoir was optioned almost immediately by Warner Brothers. Um, Steven Spielberg was slated to direct and Jennifer Lawrence was slated to play me. Um, and that went on for three years, uh, if What's not What's it like longer. taking Jennifer Lawrence to war zones? Um, I took her to the border with South Sudan when it was very, very tense. Uh, she wanted to understand what it feels like to feel that fear and to be, you know, to be close to a war zone. Um, obviously, uh, we had to worry about her safety, so I couldn't take her. Yeah, you've you got know. an extra headache. You've got to worry yeah, about a Hollywood A-lister <laughs> while you're dealing with it everything else. It was very stressful. Let's just say when I put her on the plane to, you know, from Uganda, I couldn't walk for a week. <laughs> My back went out. Um, but, um, yeah, but she eventually dropped out. Um, okay. And so now it is um, being made into a limited series. Okay. Um, so a TV series. A TV series, film. correct. Okay. But you, <laughs> at least Jennifer Lawrence now knows what it's like to do your job. She does. She's just come out with a movie playing a character named Lindsay. So, hey, I, I hope think I where she got, she got that inspiration from. But what have you learned then from being in these scenarios, coming in and coming out of, of some of the worst things we can do to each other. Yeah, I mean, I guess I've learned um, the capacity for survival, um, for resilience, for forgiveness, um, the fact that human beings can be equally evil as they can be uh, amazingly generous and, um, and, yeah, resilient. I think that I've learned a lot from the people I've covered. But I think we have to look at the ability of human beings to live both within those situations and to survive them after. Well, thank you very much for, for taking yeah. us behind the lens with you. Thank you. Lindsay. And thank you so much for being with us. Until we meet again, take care and goodbye. <laughs>